Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are over 70 folks already joined right on time. So I'm gonna jump in and get us started. My name is Lorenzo and I'm a co-host for the Knowledge Houses campaign to support 100 black and brown technologists. We have a powerhouse lineup for you today. And I know uh, we have the Knowledge Houses 2020 Innovation Fellows tuned in with us today. Uh, so I'm so excited to meet you all and have your voices be part of the conversation. It's going down in the chat. So drop a line to me and Cass from the Knowledge House. Let us know you're in the mix and we'll keep the conversation going from there. Speaking of the Knowledge House's Innovation Fellows, I am so excited and honored to introduce our very first speaker, Shioma Dunkley. Hello, everyone. My name is Chioma Dunkley, and I am an aspiring technologist and an innovation fellow here at the Knowledge House. I gained interest in tech because I wanted more opportunities for myself, and I saw that the tech field was a field that was constantly growing with opportunities, and I wanted that, and I wanted skills for the future. On my journey to exploring the tech career, I experienced the traditional for-profit boot camp, and I really struggled. And I realized that it was not a good fit for me. While networking, I ran into TKH graduates, and I was just so drawn to them because they were skilled, because they looked like me, because they just had this energy, this confidence, and sense of community that I wanted. Fast forward. I'm here today at CKH and I have this amazing diverse community where I feel supported and where people are always just working together to help each other out. And I can really say that the Knowledge House is different from other programs because they really care about us. They care about our well-being, they care about our mental health, and they really do focus on Black and Brown communities. So that means that they are invested in, in communities that are oftentimes left out of the innovation economy. And it also means that when they're developing the Innovation Fellowship, they take into consideration the different difficulties and life challenges that we may experience. So the Knowledge House knows that it's not just about opportunity, it's about having the resources, having the support and the guidance that we need to fully take advantage of those opportunities and to fully flourish and succeed in those spaces. So for me and my fellow innovation fellows, being a part of the Knowledge House, it means, it means community. It means being supported. It means more economic opportunities. It means better wages. And ultimately it means more fulfillment in life. So to my TKH uh, peers who are on the line, I just wanna shout y'all out. I wanna say thank you for pouring into me. Thank you for pouring into each other. We are meant to be here. We are needed here. So keep going. We're gonna make it. We're gonna change our communities and we can't do it by ourselves. And we haven't done it by ourselves. With the support of different donors, we raised over almost 75% of our fellowship campaign fundraising goal. So I really want to say thank you to all of our supporters and donors who give their time and their money to the Innovation Fellows. We are really grateful. And we still have a year of training ahead of us and more students coming after us. So please continue supporting, continue volunteering, continue investing in us. And thank you. Thank you for truly being a part of diversifying the workforce. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shioma. So great to hear a snapshot of your inspiring story. We have officially crossed the 100 mark. Uh, so thank you again for everyone joining us. Uh, and please enjoy this quick video. My first time at the Knowledge House, I was like scrolling Instagram and I seen someone sharing their story. After that, I was like, okay, this seems like a cool opportunity. I've been trying to say I wanted to get into tech and it seemed like the most viable option for myself at the time. And then I realized that this was like the program for me. Tech is something I always wanted to get into. I always thought it was 
far away to reach. I saw it as a goal that was far off and until I learned about this program, it felt like, wow, this is something I can actually do. Like, this is, we're gonna be set up for success. As I think about what self-directed leadership really is about. It's really inspired by purpose. Um, it's really inspired by values and it's really inspired by experience, grounded in the experience of the individuals. Fellowship campaign has opened a lot of doors for us. We had raised $300,000. Uh, our goal is uh, half a million. Right now I'm learning coding. Before this, I never thought I would even be able to achieve anything in technology. You know, I was really bad with computers. I think for me, the reason why it's so important that people invest back into these communities is because there's a wealth of talent and knowledge right here in, in New York. The fact that we have leaders in these positions who look like us, who have personal stories and narrative that shows an innate stickiness to what it is exactly that we're talking about and what we're trying to get done, that matters. I'm hoping to gain the skills to be able to succeed in the technology world and I am hoping to be able to then pay it forward to people like me and people that are struggling to uh, be better and do better in life. Um, the companies that we're working with are interested in volunteering, they're mentoring our students, and they are on board to hire interns next summer. Goldman Sachs and I are just thrilled to support you, uh, the Power Fund, and the Knowledge House. We are making a $50,000 uh, investment in the Knowledge House, in Gerald Lynn, in the leadership. If you care about these challenges, if you care about actually solving them, invest in those who have the greatest potential of actually solving them. And again, don't do it because you're trying to be selfless. Do it because you are trying to be selfish and because you actually are trying to get this work done. And it's the best investment you're gonna make. So I wanna thank the funders and supporters for being part of our journey to help us not only uplift ourselves, but uplift our families and our communities. So this fellowship campaign is bringing people together in support of our students, in support of the Bronx, in support of the future workforce. And I wanna thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So inspiring to hear from Shioba and to see a recent video from some other uh, TKH alumni uh, and the past speakers. Uh, I couldn't be more honored to introduce one of our stars of the show. When Geraldine and I started talking about events for this campaign, uh, we were throwing around big names like Wes Moore and Charles Phillips and Reed Hastings and all of you who know Geraldine, she gets the job done. Uh, she made it happen. She is the exact individual who should be leading and growing the Knowledge House. And it's truly inspiring to see her time and time again prove what's possible for herself and those around her. Live from the boogie down Bronx to Columbia University and Forbes 30 under 30 list. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming the Knowledge House co-founder and CEO, the one and only Geraldine Rodriguez. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's event. This is the second event in our virtual series. Uh, for the fellowship campaign. And I'm really excited that Reed Hastings, CEO of Netflix and Charles Phillips, chairman at Infor are joining me today. The conversation is diversifying the future of work and we have a lot to talk about. Um, thank you, thank you to the attendees, our co-host Chioma and shout out to Digital Bodega for producing that video that is highlighting the campaign and the progress that we've made. So I want to jump into the panel and full disclosure, I feel so privileged to be joined by Reed and Charles. And we actually sit on the board of KIT Foundation together. So I'm lucky to spend time with these guys often. But uh, recently I actually learned that Reed and Charles are close buddies. So I wanted to start there. Welcome. So I wanna dig in. Can you both tell us how did you get into technology and how did you bump into each other? Because I've heard that you have supported each other with growing your tech businesses. Well, it, it, we were both in the Marine Corps about 30 or 40 years ago, but Charles was actually successful in the Marine Corps and I dropped out after one summer. So that, that's the real difference. <laughs> well, 
I got started in tech a long time ago uh, when I was about 15 years old. I walked into something called a Heath Kit store. Uh, no, no one knows what that is. Maybe read might. Um, but it was kind of like a radio chat back in the day. This is when you, you couldn't buy a computer. You had, you had hobbyists who would build computers. I didn't know what it was. I thought I was walking to the auto parts store in a mall. And a guy saw me looking around. Uh, by the way, someone who didn't look like me had no reason to help me and said, hey, you know what that is? I said, no. He says, well, we build computers here. We have this club. We meet every Tuesday and Thursday night. Why don't you stop by on Tuesday? See if you like it. See, check it out. And these were all 40 and 50 year old guys at the time. I had no idea what they were doing, but being curious, I showed up and in the first 30 days, built my first computer because they taught me how to do that. And then 30 days after that, worked my first application. I was hooked. So that's why I majored in computer science, but it was all because somebody who didn't have to help me decided to do that. That's why I do these things because uh, I, mean, I don't know what I would have been doing I wouldn't, you know, if, I, if that guy hadn't done that for me. And so just the proximity and being around and having the opportunity. And so fast forward to the way I met Reed, uh, but later on after Marine Corps, I was working on Wall Street. One of the first companies I financed was a company called Pure Software. And uh, Pure Software uh, was founded by Reed. And uh, I mean, even back then, this is I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, must have been 30 years ago. He was the same way back then, just as brilliant and focused and organized. And uh, it was a big, successful IPO. And uh, I just watched his career the entire time. And then once he sold that, he, you know, went on to Netflix. I should have invested in his next thing. I was smart enough to do that. Uh, but that's how we met. And I've been following his career and watching. And when he did his deal with AWS, I did the same thing at my company because it's good enough for him. I know he's checked it out. I did the same thing and run on AWS. And um, for me, after uh, uh, dropping out of uh, the Marine Corps, I decided to be a high school math teacher in the Peace Corps. Um, and so I was in Swaziland and I loved teaching and I loved the kids, but I thought, oh, maybe I should go into technology um, because that's sort of a mix of, you know, somewhere halfway in between, you know, doing math and, and teaching and doing kids. Uh, but I didn't know that much about it. This was uh, mid 1980s. So it was a pretty small field back then. Um, and a lucky break of my life was getting into Stanford grad school in computer science because uh, I didn't have a background in computer science. And then that gave me uh, those two years <clears throat> were tremendous. And one of the big things is that there were many other people around campus who had done technology companies and they were normal. Like I had never known anyone who had actually built a company or was an entrepreneur or like all those things you read about. Um, and then I would meet them and they were like normal people. And I was like, wow, if that person could do it, maybe I can. And so um, that was probably the thing I got most out of uh, being in grad school. Um, and then like Charles said, uh, that was <clears throat> mid eighties by 95 is when uh, Charles's company, Morgan Stanley, took us public. And uh, that was super exciting. And that company, that first company, was a hardcore tech company. We did software tools for other software programmers uh, for C and C++, some of the predecessors to Java. Um, so uh, it was like deep engineering company. And then with Netflix, it's been a mix because, of course, we do a ton of back-end technology. But the consumers initially just experienced us as DVDs by, by mail and then now by streaming. And we're mostly an entertainment company. So um, I think that some of the cool parallels is, uh, you know, where Charles was 26, seven years ago was, you know, investment banking, which is, sort of helpful, but not like doing. And then it's incredibly rare for those people to move into the doing and then running companies and then to be successful at that. So it's kind of a little mutual admiration club. Um, and uh, we're so thrilled to be on the board with you, Gerald. So much. Um, thanks for that overview. Yeah. I mentioned that one of the common themes is how we're all supporting each other to thrive and diversify the tech movement. So I love hearing that story of how you all supported each other. So I want to move into today. You all gave us a sense of 
how technology, you know, transform your lives and your careers. And we're in the middle of a pandemic. So my first question for you both is what do you predict the future of work looks like post the pandemic world? And how do entrepreneurs, technologists, and job seekers prepare for that? Um, the future of tech work will be a little more distributed. I bet you would spend two or three days in an office uh, and three or four days on Zoom. So sort of think hybrid mode. The real challenge is getting that first job. Um, you know, when you don't have the credentials, that's hard. And you know, there's no secret. It's just uh, talking to lots of people, you know, uh, uh, being on LinkedIn a lot, that's the number one platform for getting that first job. And then um, once you, if you're fortunate and you get that first job, like after a year or two, um, think to yourself, how much am I learning? Uh, and almost everybody's advantaged by changing companies or jobs uh, every couple of years to whatever they're learning the most in. And sometimes you can have a great run and stay at a company for 10 years, but mm, that's rare. And most of the time is you, you first have to really use LinkedIn and your contact networks to get that first job. And then don't sit still and sort of think about it as you're always looking, always looking for the next job. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the future work was already changing pre-COVID, as you say. And certainly for a lot of people of color, they were stuck in jobs. They're probably most exposed to technology changes and automation. And so if, if anything, this is accelerates the need. We need to focus on this. So I think one good fact is as I've talked to companies and worked through uh, other nonprofits who are influencing companies, uh, getting companies to focus on skills instead of degrees, because they were over-credentializing so many jobs and requiring you know, advanced degrees for things that the last person didn't have. And yet when they go to rehire that person, once they retire, all of a sudden the default is so much higher. And that certainly is a disadvantage for a lot of people uh, in, you know, in, in underserved communities. So if uh, there's been very, several efforts uh, that happened recently where companies have committed to rethink how they hire and look at skills instead of degrees, uh, JP Morgan is doing that. We've got uh, IBM is doing that. And that's as a re result of some specific conversations we've had with them. So I do think that's a good thing. And so programs like this, as long as you have the skill sets and, and connect these programs to people who want to hire, that's one way uh, I think to get engaged with the companies are thinking about it differently right now a lot of it's a social environment that we find ourselves in. So they're rethinking and looking to hire more people of color. I hope this you know, moment lasts and doesn't go away. But for right now, I'm getting inundated with people who want to hire you know, people out of programs like this. I'm really excited to hear that. Um, and both of you have your personal strategies to diversify the workforce. So you mentioned that a lot of companies are now trying to hire diverse talent. And you talked to me about an initiative that you are leading with other companies to hire non-traditional talent. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, we're working on this project now that should be announced around January. But the, the problem we're trying to solve is the companies that want to hire, they don't know where to find people who have those skill sets. And there are workforce development programs out there, but there are a lot of them. And by you know job skill set, by industry, by location, there's thousands of them as part of the problem. And so the friction costs are too high. They can't sort through all that. So what we've offered to do, uh, a guy named Ken uh, Frazier from the Merck, CEO of Merck is working on it with me. Ken Chenault, former CEO of American Express and Jenny Rometty from IBM is we will build you a network. We will do the qualifications for you and find the ones that work and measure them and make sure they're performing. Make sure that the applicants have all the skill sets. Not, so it's not just a skill, it's the getting into the corporate environment, it's having childcare, it's transportation, what we call wraparound services. And at the end of the eight week or 10 week program, we will make sure that you've gotten someone who can do the job and we'll find it for you. And so the companies, we've got about 35 companies that came from the business council who've committed to doing it. Uh, they're contributing about $3 million a year to build this network out, this Black Jobs Network. 
and then they're committing to hire a certain amount each year. So the, 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 uh, the theme of the whole thing is a million black jobs over the next 10 years. They, you know, that's what we're trying to build out, figure out how to do that, but good jobs. And so we figured we had to start somewhere in this moment why people are interested and we can get something like this funded. Uh, let's do it. And so the company execs I mentioned, we'll all be on the board. We'll hire executive director and we're gonna launch this hopefully around January. Um, so in my conversation with Wes Moore and Asahi Pompey yes, uh, last week, we talked about jobs and skills as one way to uplift people of color and help them uh, thrive in the workforce. And then we also talked about investment, right? So Robinhood is now investing in organizations led by people of color. And we think it's so important to not only arm people with skills, but also invest in the community leaders that are doing the work. And so Reed, I'd love to ask you about your personal strategy. You're a huge philanthropist. So first of all, why is it important that you are a donor of the Knowledge House and what other uh, philanthropic priorities do you have this year? Well, I've been so fortunate uh, with the success, both of that first company that Charles helped take public and then Netflix, that now we can do a bunch of philanthropy across a wide range of sectors. Um, so within the US, uh, I guess I'm mostly focused on education. Um, so a uh, wide range of efforts in uh, major American cities. Uh, Indianapolis, Camden, uh, Newark, uh, as well as an overlay of uh, KIPP schools, and really focused on K-12. <clears throat> K-12 is not the only issue, and it doesn't cure everything, but um, you know, a strong K-12 foundation helps. And what I found is all of these challenges, whether it's getting into the workforce or um, K-12 or, or college completion, you know, are hard problems. And so I'm kind of focused on primarily on this one of K-12. And then, um, you know, the support of a range of organizations uh, like Knowledge House is because they're making a difference in their area. And it's sort of not in my core, but I kind of fall in love with the area and the approach. You know, it, it's uh, so it's not like a broad systematic thing. I would say that one is more opportunistic of, you know, finding or seeing great entrepreneurs and uh, backing them. Whereas in K-12 for me, then it's sort of more systematic and I'll spend, you know, most of my time in that. But, you know, it's uh, there, there's many great areas and, you know, a lot of great need. And some of the best work happens in this grassroots way, uh, like Knowledge House, where people are close, um, you know, to the people being served, and um, and that's what's one of the powerful things in Knowledge House. Thanks, Reed and Charles, and I definitely appreciate your investment in our community. So I want to dig into some challenging questions, specifically about diversifying the tech workforce, and so I think. The main question for the hour, right? Like all attendees really want to hear from you all. Is there a pipeline problem or not, right? So really quickly, I'd love to hear from you both. What do you think the root cause is for the lack of diversity in tech? Um, well, I worked in tech a long time and I have to say, I didn't see a lot of people that look like me in my career. It's starting to change now, thankfully. Uh, there is a pipeline problem, but you create your own pipelines. If you want a pipeline, you'll create one. And so if you look in the same places, you will always have a pipeline problem. So one is getting people to think differently and, and uh, create programs and recruit from in different places. Uh, secondly, I do think internal to our own community, uh, I've been talking to some of the leaders of major universities and especially HBCUs. We do need to change how people think about career paths and what they major in. Something like 70, 75% of us end up majoring in theology, sociology, and things like that. That's tough if you start off with that, don't have the background. You've heard Reed's story how, how early he started. I was a computer science major. So, but if you don't know that when you're making that decision at the time, I don't think you can do it. And a lot of times they can't, they just don't know that. You, that's a valuable time and you could be getting the right skill sets. And so we got to educate people that you can do this and give them confidence as well. 
So it's a combination of things, but there are, I think, so many people who could do the work if they had access to it. We had this proximity problem I, I mentioned earlier. If you're not around it, mine was random. I don't know. Like I said, I just got lucky. Um, but we need some, a more formal process than that. I, you know, I think it's this, this, the same thing, which is you can create a pipeline if it's important to you. But the attitude up until the last five years has been, you know, let me just uh, treat people fairly who apply and not worry if the applicant pool is biased. So companies have cared about, you know, treating people equally of those who apply, um, but not like trying to get involved in the societal issues that bias the applicant pool. That resonates for sure. Um, we've seen companies you know, work to tackle the lack of diversity problem for years now, right? And after the murder of George Floyd this summer, we saw a lot of companies get inspired to, you know, announce diversity pledges, statements of solidarity. My question for you both is why does it take so much death and unrest to provoke actions from major companies? Well, I think that's because the major companies are extremely competitive with each other. And it takes a lot of focus just to stay alive. So if you think of universities, they last a long time, hundreds of years. If you think of countries, they last a long time, hundreds of years. If you think of religions, they last a long time, hundreds of years. Companies don't last. Companies get killed by other companies all the time. There are no 200 year old companies, okay? And so you have to remember that to keep your company alive, you have to be incredibly focused on your customers and your opportunities and what you're doing. And if you take a, you know, it's like driving in the Grand Prix or something and you're going at 200 miles an hour. You know, if you take your eye off of what drives your success for moments, you crash and die your company's gone. And we've known so many companies, Charles and I personally known the people whose companies died. In our day, Scott McNeely was a great CEO. Sun Microsystems was a great company. It's gone in one generation. So we live in panic and fear and focus about surviving, meaning serving our customers better. So there's limited bandwidth to be able to devote to broader societal issues as a company, because the company, you know, if you lose focus, you, you die. So it, it is unfortunate that it takes something like George Floyd to get people to shift and to recognize the societal uh, scar of anti-blackness is not going to just gently go away that we all, the actors of society, companies, universities, government are gonna have to lean into that. Um, <clears throat> but that's that's the reality. Yeah, that's, I, could, you know, I couldn't say it any better, but I would say also the pressure from shareholders and owners that uh, you have people giving you capital, uh, they wanna see the stock go up, they wanna see value created, anything that's not doing that for them, if they can't see a straight line of that, it's been hard to convince them these other things are important because they, you know, any penny spent on something other than creating shareholder value, uh, at least in the past, was an issue. I think it's changing a bit now, and people are realizing that this is actually good for the business. These are your future customers, your future employees. Um, so it's actually a good thing for the economy to kind of be a little more uh, diverse. That's actually one of the arguments I used with the other project that I described earlier ago. Like it or not, the demographics are changing and you want your future customers to have disposable income and to be buying housing and all the things and same thing your employee pool is going to change eventually so the question is do you wait until it's upon you or do you start planning for that now so i'm hoping with george floyd and all these other trends that this is real this time and that they stick with it i think also what's missing though is transparency what i've found is when companies start disclosing their racial makeup on their website something very public and put out a goal uh, just like any other business goal they start to you know manage to that because now people can see it paypal did a great job of that and so i'm hoping that becomes more standard and i'm hoping that uh third party you know kind of advisors like iss institutional shareholder services who kind of criticize companies start to require that 
And so that in itself uh, could be a, an enormous pressure to get people to think differently. So Charles, can you tell us um, what has worked and what has not worked when it comes to moving the needle with tech diversity? Um, and if you can talk about like um, the companies you have supported, that would be great. Uh, yeah, so I think um, it was a topic that a lot of companies and CEOs just did not want to talk about before because, if, you know, in the past, at least, the default was those are things that you talk about outside the workplace. Uh, now, uh, I just had breakfast with a couple of CEOs this morning. They're under a lot of pressure from all employees to talk about these issues and what are our values. And so the first step is acknowledging it's a problem and that uh, we need to have some strategy around this. Okay, to talk about it, we can have differences from where we came from, but we have common goals and getting people in the language and they're so worried about saying something wrong, it, it's uncomfortable to talk about. And because one, one wrong word to get crucified. So I understand the risk that they perceive, but they're gonna have to deal with it. So that's kind of step one. Step two is a measurement I talked about. And step three is a lot of them are asking like, okay, what do I do next? If, even if I wanna do it, I just never done this before. And so having some playbook on how to hire, how to create your own uh, pipeline, going to different places that they haven't been going through historically can help. And so I just think uh, a lot of them are hiring consultants now, the people who are diversity and inclusion um, consultants are doing very well right now. I don't know if there's enough scale, but there's an enormous lack of just what do I do now? And so I think that's where we can all help and just give them playbooks to help them a little bit. Thanks for that. And Reed, um, my question for you is specific to Netflix investment. So this summer, Netflix moved 2% of their cash, which was 100 million to black banks. Uh, and so when you make a big commitment to diversify tech or support black and brown lives, how can you influence other companies to do the same? Well, uh, lots of companies uh, are doing a similar now. Uh, PayPal just announced something uh, yesterday, I think, um, and that's great. Uh, Costco uh, recently did, so many people have. Um, and what we're doing is saying, you know, if we put a, let's see, to back up, the, the problem of uh, isolation and segregation is not limited to people or housing, it's also capital. Um, and black banks are undercapitalized relative to other banks. Um, and a small thing as if corporate America can lean in and help on the capitalization of black banks, they'll have more money uh, to loan to black entrepreneurs and black aspiring homeowners. So that's uh, the rationale for doing it. And um, for a company, they don't wanna put a lot of money in a small bank, a big percentage, that's scary but almost everyone will say, okay, we could put one or 2% uh, of our money <clears throat> in, in these banks. Um, so uh, that's been the start of a, of a nice trend to see. And then from the bank's point of view, uh, they wanna get many companies because they don't wanna be dependent on any one company. So it's the, the success of it is really getting um, many people to put some of their capital um, into black banks. And then the black banks have to do their part, which is actually loaning the money out to building economic wealth, either to the aspiring homeowner or to the small business. I'll also add, I think Netflix as a huge brand, y'all just have so much influence, you know? So um, it's expected that people are following your lead. And I think that's in a privileged position to be, so all power to you. Um, I do wanna go into one more question that's super relevant as we have election day coming up uh, and then we'll move into Q and A. So I'll actually ask this to Charles. So we hear every day from the news how polarizing technology can be. Can you share your stance on the role that technology can play in spreading misinformation? And how can we use technology to increase voter education and voter turnout? Yeah, so um, I think we're all familiar with the, you know, the power of technology of getting information out quickly. And uh, we're in a new world where it's unfiltered, we don't have editors anymore. And that's why we had the, you know, all, the, all the social media companies who are on Capitol Hill today testifying about this exact topic. So it is a beast we've created. It can be good, it can be bad, but it, as it stands today, it's hard to control, and we'll have to have a debate about how much control we want to put on speech. 
but technology can also educate. So to your point, uh, I'm, I'm a co-chair of something called the Black Economic Alliance, and we're doing a lot of these projects I'm talking about. They have a site that does get out the vote. And uh, COVID forced us to kind of think of it differently. So doing the, the digital outreach, the texting, uh, all the different channels that you can do, it has been tremendous in teaching people how to vote, coming up with a voting plan since there's so much suppression and coming up with how to vote um, either by absentee ballot or vote by mail. 11% uh, of black people vote by mail in previous elections. So it's not something we're used to doing culturally. We, it's a ceremony to go to the, the polls. And so this is a new era. So we had to get that information out that there are other ways to vote. Uh, a lot of people couldn't get to the polls. Some of them had to work. Some of them had the disability issues and sometimes they just moved the polls. And so we organize uh, ballot pickups for people to go in neighborhoods and pick up ballots and deliver them, which you can do in most states right now. Uh, and so using technology to communicate all these different options to vote uh, was tremendous. And we'll see how it works out, but at least you know people are registering and we hope they all vote. We love to see it. Thank you so much, Charles. And everyone, please go vote if you have not already. Um, and I want to move into Q&A. So thank you to those attendees that sent your questions in advance. We have some of them here, and this will be like a rapid round of questions. So I want to start with a fun question. This one is from Ian McKenzie, uh, and it's about your everyday life. So can you tell us what you did yesterday that was unique? And what is the typical start of the day for you both? And we can start with Reed and then Charles. Y'all like this question, I can tell. <laughs> uh, the great thing about my job is how much uh, variation is there is between the days. No two days are the same. Uh, yesterday, I was at an in-person offsite of our top six leaders. We had all gotten tested. Um, and uh, we went uh, to one of their homes um, in California and then sat around a small table and debated what we should be doing and, you know, various parts of Netflix. And it felt so great to be in person, um, safe, uh, eating and talking and uh, just being together. Yeah, every day is different. I can't remember what I did this morning, let alone yesterday, but... <laughs> I would say yesterday, what stands out, I did go to uh, the Apollo Theater board, board meeting, uh, which was kind of fun to see other people again, the same thing. And, um, and obviously, arts organizations have been struggling in New York, not being able to perform since March. But we have a plan, and just seeing people optimistic and wanting to bring the city back here locally was good. Met with a few companies who were considering investing in, all tech companies, and so the normal stuff I do most days, but it was just, I'm usually up by 5, 5.30, and it doesn't end to whatever in the evening. So I just, uh, so much to do and so much to learn. I like learning, and so at least everybody I meet with teaches me something. Great, thanks for sharing that. So the next question is for Netflix. Uh, what is the hardest part of keeping the company at the top of the industry? And this question is from our innovation fellow, Elston Bell. A competition. I mean, we have uh, Disney and Universal and HBO on one side and Apple and Amazon on another. And, you know, so that you, the consumer, get all this amazing content for low prices. Um, so that's the tough part is staying ahead of them in terms of producing the, the shows that people want to watch. Um, so uh, it's all, all, always pretty dynamic. Thank you, Reed. The next question actually covers some of the questions that we're getting in the chat. So this one is from Mark Sievert, and it is, how do we get companies who state their intentions for a diverse workplace but never develop the systems to create those diverse uh, candidates? What holds companies back from following through? And how are you avoiding this pitfall at your companies? Do you want to take that, Charles? Well, I think historically, this just hasn't been a focus. They weren't motivated enough to do something different from what they've always done because they were focused on other things. Uh, my only hope is that now it's, it's different. Uh, the fact that people are asking for techniques and plans and trying to develop uh, a way to, to change what they've done already and willing to be measured. Uh, just a conversation around this. So I think the accountability is, like I said earlier, transparency. Once you commit to something, you should measure it and be held accountable for it. I think boards of directors um, before, I can't say this came up. I've been on a lot of boards 
And uh, this didn't come up a lot in boardrooms unless I raised it. And now there's, you're establishing committees on this and uh, hiring DNI officers, and it's a board level discussion that it wasn't a year ago, or even you know five years ago. So uh, again, I hope it's sustainable, but people are more interested now, and there's more happening than ever before. So we have another fun question that I'll ask both of you. This is a good one. It's about hi um, hiring. This one is from Tatiana Pyers. The question is, what are some good questions that you would ask a future boss in an interview to determine if they're a good fit for the company? Reed, and then. I don't think Reed's ever had a boss. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, think you can answer that. <laughs> I would ask, uh, you know, sort of, uh, how, how, if I work hard, you know, how will I learn a lot? You know, it's uh, the fundamental bargain is, you know, the employee, you know, leaning in and working really hard and the employer continuing to grow uh, the employee's skills and opportunities. Yeah, and something along those lines as well. I was going to say, what does success look like? Uh, what are you expecting of me? And what's the win-win for me and for you a year from now, two years from now, five years from now? And uh, what's the career path of someone who's kind of taking a similar role? Give me some examples of who's gone from point A to point B. I'd like to see what that looked like. Nothing's predictable and never quite the same, but it'd just be interesting to see what's happened prior to me arriving here in this job. A version of that, of which I totally agree with, is just asking, what would make me your most successful employee? These are bold questions for sure. <laughs> what resonated for folks um, in the chat is what makes this a win-win? So thank you for yeah. that. Okay, so we have the next question from Pierre Caras, one of our co-hosts from Goldman Sachs. And this is about internet access. So as internet access still remains a privilege in the US and in most of the world and companies rely on more users to watch content, what are companies doing to step in and support internet for all initiatives? You know, they're not much is the answer to your question. Um, companies uh, who are like us that are applications like uh, Uber or Netflix or others depend upon, you know, broad internet access. And that is happening. Um, you know, the internet is getting cheaper and faster and more accessible. Um, Comcast, amongst other companies, has, a, you know, a great $10 a month um, broad access um, for Title I students and families with Title I students, as an example. So in general, we see that as things grow, they get more affordable. And, you know, it's really a great uh, role of government using the uh, E-rate uh, money to then subsidize internet access so that more people, especially in rural areas, um, are able to have internet access. Yeah, I'd agree. I'm here in New York and report just came out on the kind of internet plans for the city here. And there's 1.5 million people that don't have internet access here, even in a city as dense as New York. And I think a lot of it is, even if you, it's available, it's not affordable to a lot of people. And the companies, they're doing what companies do. If it doesn't make sense, there's no return on it. They don't want to lay more fiber or do more work or they just can't bring down the cost. At least that's been the story, especially in rural areas, as, as we've mentioned. So some of the ideas that are out there is having more cities uh, kind of take ownership of expanding and financing um, internet build out. And we'll see how that works. Some cities have tried it. Uh, some of the uh, telecom companies have actually fought that. They don't want to get into the business. But we're going to have to find a way to finance this because it's too important to the future of work and education, now, especially post-COVID. we got to find a way to spread it. Absolutely, especially during the pandemic. That's something that we just need to all come around. Um, and Reed, one of my fellows mentioned that to fix this problem, we need more competition. So thanks for highlighting that. So for the next two minutes, I want to uh, go into specific hiring questions. So we'll do this really quickly. Uh, our fellow Shafi Ahmed asks, as someone with no college degree and minimal work experience, I am wondering how much emphasis companies like Netflix put on the degrees and resumes for hiring compared to other metrics like creativity, skills, 
and uh, projects and portfolios. So that's for you. Uh, it's a fair amount, uh, unfortunately, on degrees because it forms uh, a filtering mechanism that helps people uh, make decisions. So it's it varies by part of the business. On productions, there's a number of people who get hired as a production assistant, um, and that's a good entry-level role. And then there's a, a ton of uh, industrial roles, essentially, for electricians and uh, lighting people and uh, that are... Uh, solid paying jobs, um, separate from the core tech that uh, Gerilyn, you guys focus on. Um, but it's it's not impossible. It's just a, a lot harder uh, without a degree. And that's where a lot of these non-degree programs, um, you know, are becoming good pipelines. So, you know, I see some change of that in the tech space. And my next question is going to be for Charles. So we have a question from Courtney Murphy and also Hannah Weinstock. And it's about how do we create career pathways for disengaged or disconnected youth, particularly those that have been previously incarcerated? And part two, what role do you see community colleges playing in diversifying the workforce? Yeah, both good questions. On the community colleges, they will be included in the program that I mentioned earlier. They are an underutilized resource. Uh, right now, a lot of people go to those colleges, uh, graduate, but there's no job because they are connected to employers. And so that's one of the roles that's what we're trying to create is find the ones that work and connect them directly to people looking for that particular uh, skill set. Um, so I think that's important and they can be you know, much more important than they have been in the past. The, the re-entry programs, which is a major area, not all companies are uh, signed up for that yet, but it's increasing. More importantly, the number of programs that are uh, directed at that area, nonprofits who are doing that are increasing. It's been hard to get funding for those programs because people thought, you know, that's not something you can raise money off of. Only recently has it come up and companies have started to change their minds. So we're way behind as a country on that, especially given how many people we incarcerate. But there's some huge success story in St. Louis and places like that, nonprofits who have figured this out. We just have to educate people and get it funded more. Well, that's great, Charles. I think we want to end there because you have informed us that the tech sector is working on it. And Reed, you let us know that non-degree programs are becoming good solutions to diversify the pipeline. And so I want to thank you both for supporting this campaign, supporting the Innovation Fellows, and supporting emerging technologists. And I am so hopeful that the more we work together, the more we can diversify tech and really uh, provide opportunities to people from non-traditional backgrounds. And I look forward to doing that with you both. So, Geraldine, you are so practical and focused on the economy. You're n you're not even asking what shows should people be watching on Netflix. <laughs> So, I have to give you a recommendation. There are so many questions in the chat about screenwriting, movies. So well, let, me, let me just say, I, I know you're big on the Bronx, but our new show, Grand Army, is about high school in Brooklyn, um, is extraordinary. So I, re I recommend Grand Army to everyone. And uh, also, you have your new book out. So if you right. grab it, um, and learn more about innovation at Netflix and how you all are unique. That'd be great. And I'm also trying to take those best practices and move them onto the nonprofit management space. So we'll follow up about that. Um, but thank you both so much for your time. I know you all are extremely busy. So thank you for your support. We look forward to partnering with you all. And I want to go ahead and say a special thank you to our sponsors. Um, we have raised almost 75% of our fundraising as Fiona has mentioned. And just a quick shout out to our sponsors. Um, I wanted to have one of our leading sponsors, Cloudinary, provide closing remarks. And without further, uh, Sanjay Sarabi, please introduce yourself and tell us about Cloudinary and why you're supporting this campaign. Thank you, Geraldine and Lorenzo, for, for the opportunity to talk this afternoon. It was very inspirational to, to hear Charles and Reed talk about not just their 
experiences, but what, what about what they're doing to to broaden the diversity in the tech community. So, um, Geraldine and Lorenzo, your your organization's an inspiration, and I think it's been it's fair to say that it's been as rewarding and enlightening for us at Cloudinary as hopefully it's been for the for the students uh, and fellows that we've worked with. Uh, so, why did we partner with the Knowledge House? Um, we're a tech company that's been around eight years and uh, we are globally distributed. We, we're in Israel, we're in the US, we're in, in the UK. And we hire not just people who are excellent in, in R&D or in marketing or in sales, but really who have a predisposition to engage with the communities in which they live. Uh, so when we heard about the Knowledge House, uh, we knew that there was a natural partnership in the making. And, and our cultural belief in education and constant learning is, is one that maps really well to your focus uh, as well. And, and if, we, if I look back and I was chatting with the team here about some of those volunteer highlights that have gone on in, in 2020, uh, I think two stand out. One, we've been partnering with you around sharing our career journeys. Uh, we have about 260 people who work at Cloudinary, uh, each of whom has his or her own story uh, in tech and how they got to tech, uh, into technology. And rarely is um, that story uh, real linear. Uh, each of us has um, uh, her, his or her own unique story. I, I was interested in Charles's story about how somebody took a chance on him in, in a store and invited him to essentially a, a user group. And in a lot of ways, that was my story as well. I was not in technology. I was in the nonprofit world and then in, in consulting, and I bumped into a classmate who introduced me to the CEO of a tech company way back when. And uh, I got hooked and uh, he took a chance on me, uh, especially since I didn't have a degree in computer science and I didn't have a degree in, in, in the sorts of things that would be natural fits in, um, in, in technology. And so I'm very grateful to, to him and to my friend for, for that introduction. So, um, but I think, um, e I think when each, we've had people from sales, from marketing, from, R&D from customer success and customer support, talk to various students, and I think they found it to be incredibly enlightening. And then we've done uh, the mentorships, the deep engagement uh, with students one-on-one -on -one to share some of the, the more detailed stories around what works in, in their, for their careers in technology and how we can help them approach a career in technology. Uh, and I think those, um, those stories are hopefully very helpful to the different students. Um, and Gerilyn asked, you know, what's, you know, why should, you know, a company think about diversifying their workforce? And, and I'm a huge believer that technology is powered by original ideas. And, but those ideas are shaped by different experiences, whether those are education experiences, whether those are uh, where you've lived, how you've been brought up. Uh, and I think it would be a disservice not to take advantage uh, of that of those variety of experiences and education and skill sets, uh, no matter what the color of your skin. So uh, we've been very excited to, to partner with the Knowledge House, and we look forward to continuing to do so in the future. Thank you so much. And we have folks uh, highlighting you all in the chat because they have mentors from Cloudinary. Cloudinary staff joined the last career class. And so thank you so much. So with that, I'd love to close. Um, again, I'd love to uh, send another shout out to our sponsors as well as our co-hosts, our students and our supporters. Remember, it's not over. Um, we are only 75%. Uh, towards our fundraising goal. So if you have not yet, please donate and tell your friends to donate. And if your employer has not sponsored, go and put that plug in for us and end of year giving is coming up. So you'll be hearing from us soon. Here are our sponsors. 
Um, I want to shout out the co-hosts that have volunteered to support this campaign because they have been the ones to bring these sponsors to us. And these folks, not only are they funding the Knowledge House, but they're hiring interns for next summer, they're volunteering and they're mentoring. So I appreciate all of the support. And with that, I wish you all a happy evening and please stay in touch and be on the lookout for more information about an upcoming event that has very special speakers, but you'll have to wait to hear more. So thanks everyone, have a good evening.